अजात शत्रु आलोक संभाव्यो हव्यवाहन लोक कारो वेद कार सूत्र कार सनातन नमस्ते सो दिस श्लोक ऑफ शिव सहस्रनाम रियली एम्फोसाइजेस शिव इफोलजेंस I mean, in the last shloka too, there were several names that reference his glow, his effulgence, his presence, which is palpably felt as an increase in consciousness, awareness, and realization, insight. So, what is the nature then of Shiva's effulgence? Well, first of all, he's a jata shatru. one whose enemy was never born shiva is existence itself so how can anyone call him enemy <laughs> we're all very attached to our existence aren't we i mean to the point where living beings actively resist injury and death so in that case we we see existence itself as our friend not as our enemy even though sometimes shiva has to revoke the existence of certain trouble makers he does so out of compassion especially compassion for his devotees uh, they come first for him and if anybody any you know demoniac character wants to upset the status quo well they have to answer to shiva shiva is liable to just uncreate them <laughs> poof but no he only kills the body he doesn't kill the living entity which goes on to accept the results of its activities as karma in a, another life another embodiment and this goes on until one learns the lessons until one understands the law of god then one begins to act nicely and become shiva's friend that's what this is all about so okay the next one then is aloka sambhavya this is really the key that means that one whose existence is inferred through his luster through his effulgence his glow the light of spiritual existence is not ordinary light not the kind of light you see with your eyes reflecting off of objects rather it's an intrinsic light similar to the light that we experience during dreams if you think about it if you remember or experience your dreams clearly everything is lit but there don't seem to be any lights <laughs> the illumination comes from within and this is more like the nature of shiva's effulgence his effulgence gives existence gives being itself so when we say god said let there be light what he really meant was let everything exist because one of the things about emptiness or nothingness the void sushupti is the lack of illumination everything is dark even though there might be some uh, objects there huh they are hidden by the darkness we don't know we can't see them because there's nothing to manifest their presence so shiva's light is more like the light of consciousness that reaches out and illuminates the existence of the objects that are there but we can't see them that's why i compared it to insight there are many phenomena many existences even beings that are present but we can't see them because they're subtle our senses are limited to the material elements which are earth water fire 
air, and space. Fire means light, sight, in other words, uh, just like sound. Huh? Sound passes through earth, water, air, fire, ultimately even akasha, space. So when we perceive sound, we know, oh, there's something there. And sound perception will wake us up even out of a deep sleep if we think there's some danger to the body or something. So these perceptions, these uh, instances of consciousness, six kinds of consciousness according to the Buddha, are due to Shiva's effulgence. Without Shiva's effulgence, those objects would remain hidden because we would not be perceptive of them. Another way that Shiva makes things exist is through upadis. An upadi is called a limiting adjunct. Limiting because it sets boundaries on beingness. And it's an adjunct because it's not really part of what is. It's only software. It's only maya, illusion. But it still works. It still happens. So, for example, we were talking the other day about Shiva's form. Shiva's form is maya. Well, it's an abstraction. It's an illusion. Why? Because it's a limitation of Brahman existence. Shiva himself is a nirguna Brahman. Nirguna without qualities. So qualities, to have qualities requires some border, some differentiation. Well, this is light and this is dark. Huh? Or this is near and this is far. Uh, so we start to see dichotomies of things. So in other words, an upadi is that which distinguishes one thing from another. And we all have the upadi, for example, of jivatman. Uh, jivatman is the quality of being as a, a born living entity. But Shiva has the quality of Ishatvam. Ishatvam means he's the Supreme Lord. And the other uh, of three demigods, Brahma and Vishnu, also have Ishatvam. Their commands are valid and uh, unstoppable throughout the entire universe. But, of course, <laughs> the universe itself is limited. The universe exists, you know, only for a few hundred billion years. <laughs> and then it, it merges back into Brahman. How? By removing the limiting adjuncts, the upadis. It says, well, this is and this is not. See? So... Without these boundaries, without these restrictions, without these limits, there wouldn't be any way to say, well, this is one object and this is another. Or even, this exists and this does not exist. See, Or that this is empty space, but then over here we have a thing, of, <laughs> an object that we're aware of. This is all due to limiting adjuncts, upadi. So the kind and style of upadi determines the nature and scope of the phenomenon. See, this is all very logical when you think of it in terms of Brahman. Brahman is the root. Brahman is the source. And then everything else that seems to exist is some kind of limiting adjunct applied to Brahman. So Shiva is that Brahman, and he alone exists, actually exists. <laughs> Everything else relatively exists due to the application of these upadis. So Havyavahana means the carrier of the sacrificial offerings from the sacrificer to the Lord, and that is fire. Fire, or Agni, is the first created thing in the universe. Let there be light. So fire is 
uh, how can I say, interpenetrates everything in the universe. That's why uh, Buddha said, the universe is burning. Everything is burning. The mind is burning. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, all the senses, the body, uh, the whole world is burning. That means it's gradually evaporating, gradually being used up. Like a fire consumes fuel. The very act of existing consumes the substance of an object because it's not natural, see? It's the result of an upadi. So that upadi being illusion gradually wears away, it evaporates. The scope only depends upon the nature of the object, the nature of the restrictions of being that bring it into apparent existence in the first place. <laughs> so Shiva is then the carrier of the sacrificial offerings and he's also the Lokakara, the maker of the worlds, again, through his effulgence and through his limiting adjuncts. He's the Vedakara, maker of the Vedas, Sutrakara, the author of the aphorisms, the sutras, like Vedanta Sutra or the Yoga Sutras, or there are many Tantra Sutras and so on. They're all ultimately coming from Shiva because he is the ultimate light that illuminates everything, that gives beingness to everything, consciousness to everything. See, that consciousness that is distributed everywhere and in everything and that gives everything being and allows it to exist and be perceived by others, that's Shiva's light, the light of consciousness, the light of Brahman. And... Finally, sanatana, eternal. This is his nature eternally. He never becomes exhausted. His light never goes out. But the material universe appears to cease to exist because not, not his light, but the upadis eventually evaporate. In fact, I just saw an article on, on the physics site yesterday that eventually everything in the universe, including the black holes, will evaporate. <laughs> so it's confirmed. This is the Vedic view. And the Vedic view, the ancients had it right. And if you follow these views, if you follow especially the ways of life given in the Vedas, you'll find that they're so much superior to materialistic being and consciousness. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shaktihi. Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. 